often when we have an unpleasant feeling, our mind tries to numb out the feeling by putting our attention on trying to figure out who's bad and who's wrong. That's where the judgmental thinking comes from, okay? And it's actually, you could think of it as a tragic strategy for trying to help you to feel better. Your mind is trying to contribute to your well-being, okay? By trying to help you figure out who is wrong and who is bad. And it's going to switch between you and them. So it's first gonna go, depending on you, if you're an internalizer, it's gonna to go to you first and say, here you go again, this is what you're doing and this is what's right. And, and it's, it's your mind's way of trying very unsuccessfully and very painfully, but it is trying to help you learn and grow. That's the deep need it's trying to meet. Wants to help you get clarity and wants to help you get understanding and wants you to grow and evolve, but it does it in a very shaming and blaming way, these judgments. And then when you decide that it's not me, it turns to the other person, then you become an externalizer and it says, well, then it must be these people. So now we're gonna try and figure out, meet needs for clarity and understanding and learning and growth for them. And the mind does it through a dualistic frame mm -hmm. by figuring out what is wrong. That's domination consciousness, right? That's the kind of like toxic um, programming that many of us got installed. And so we will all find this inside of ourselves, this tendency to try and figure out what's wrong with them and what's wrong with me. And it infuses our language. So even when somebody is trying to help you in a really open-hearted way, if they're not awake or they're not on this kind of a journey, they'll try and help you by telling you what's wrong with you. And think about how our school systems are set up. We try to help everybody by letting them know what's wrong with them. It's so infused in our culture. So this is how we will relate with ourselves and others as a default. Step number one is awareness of that happening, noticing it, which you're saying you've got. I can see when the judgment and the criticism, the interpretation and the dualism arises inside of me. And I can also feel the distress that it brings. Okay, step two, if we want to transcend dualism and judgment, then we need to greet it with curiosity and compassion, okay? Trap number one is judging the judgment. Trap number one is getting in resistance to this thing that we're finding inside of ourselves and your mind is gonna say, aha, that's what's wrong with you. You're judgmental. <laughs> and now you're stuck on a karmic wheel because you've just judged the judgment which makes you judgmental and you are trapped in the dualism. So what we want to do is learn how to relax and work with ourselves and other people as they are and as we are. That is the essence of nonviolence. Bringing love, not judgment. Bringing curiosity and compassion, not rejection and control and coercion and evaluation and interpretation. But the advanced level of practice is not seeing thinking as bad, not seeing judgment as bad, not seeing any of this as something to be getting rid of. Because when we start approaching it as something that we have to get rid of, we begin fragmenting ourselves instead of integrating ourselves. So we're not about fragmentation. We're not about sending things into the shadows. We're about bringing everything into the light. So as you find all of the places inside of you that are judgmental and critical and projecting and injecting and doing all of these normal human things that our psychological immune system has learned how to do in domination societies, fine. We greet it by relaxing, by welcoming, oh, here you are. Oh, here it is. Here's the next layer of my practice coming up for me. Welcome. And I find in myself how revoltingly judgmental I am. And my first task is to love up that aspect of myself. That's where we start the practice, is learning to love and relax. There's nothing bad here. It is a strategy. It's trying to meet a need. 
I didn't create the strategy. I didn't necessarily even choose the strategy. It is what I inherited from all of the generations of history that came before me. I am just taking it from this step in, evol in our human evolutionary journey. I'm waking up to our current rough draft <laughs> and I'm gonna take it to the next step. So now your question is what's the next step? We translate every judgment into the underlying feelings and needs. And then we move into the practice that Marshall Rosenberg brought into the world, which is the practice. He just gave us a quick four step model, which is really useful. What am I observing? What actually happened or didn't happen? What was actually said or not said? And we get really, really good at separating out. Here's the neutral observation. And here's my interpretation. Here's what it meant to me. Here's how I'm interpreting it. Here's how I'm evaluating it. Now, for those of you who've worked with me for a long time, I know you, you've heard me say this a million times, but we do not make the meaning making or the interpretation or the evaluation bad or wrong. It is legitimate data. We want to learn how to work with our meaning making systems. So it's not that we don't think or we don't judge or we don't evaluate or we don't interpret. That's not, that's not the point. It's about discerning the difference between the part of me that does have a meaning and an interpretation, and then the part of me that can also cue into the behavioral neutral thing so that I have both of those tools instead of just one. The next piece, the next discernment is, I, what you're, you're saying you're aware of is all of the thinking, right? All of the judgments. So I'm already aware of the thinking here on the side. And now what I want to do is I want to counterbalance it with what are the feelings that are in the space as well? When I am thinking in this way, what feelings are alive for me? And this is the practice of getting my attention off of the thinking space, off of the hijacked mind that is going to ruminate in analysis, not because that's bad, but because it's incomplete and because we overdo it. Mm. So I put that on hold for a moment and I say, dear mind, I'm going to come back to you. I, I know you've got some good information, but this is not actually the thing that's helpful to me. What am I feeling? And your mind wants you to stay out of touch with your feelings, because if you're feeling some kind of distress, that's its way of trying to help you not be in distress. Mm -hmm. Don't feel it. Think instead. Thinking is so much more pleasant than feeling especially if you're feeling shame or especially if you're feeling pain of any kind or distress or anguish, don't do that. Just think, come join me here and think in the playground. Okay. And so we, we develop some courage. This is why it's the language of the heart. We develop the courage to feel again. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, dear mind, hold on. What am I actually feeling? And then we develop an emotional literacy and we get really good at tuning into what's happening in my body, what sensations are alive what are the emotions coming through me? And so we sort of tune into the weather, the internal weather. And again, your mind, if there's some distress, is going to tell you, well, this is bad and this is wrong and you need to fix it and you need to get rid of it. We need, it gets very urgent and insistent about getting rid of the feelings. And then we kind of need to soothe that part of ourselves by saying, hey, I've got this. It's okay. Feelings are not going to kill us. The feelings actually tell us about what we are needing. And so if I'm feeling frustrated, I might be needing more ease. If I'm feeling lonely, I might be needing more connection and community and belonging. If I'm feeling tired, I might be needing rest and rejuvenation and spaciousness. So I need to know what my feeling state is. I want to know what the weather is, not just the disembodied dualistic judgmental mind. We'll come back to where that's useful. But I want to know what my subjective experience is, and I want to dignify it, honor it, and connect with it. And so I tune into my feelings, and then I take them to my needs, and I, I wonder what do these feelings tell me about the needs of mine, and needs being our intrinsic motivators, the things that matter to us for survival and thriving, right? So what am I needing? And Tracy, in the, in the um, example you were giving, it might be a need for um, understanding. It might be a need for appreciation, acknowledgement, 
to be seen, to be known. You know, there, there it could be psychological safety. There could be all sorts of things that are up. But I want to really ground myself in what is the need that is sort of raising its head and saying, hey, pay attention to me. And that's where I put my attention. I put my attention on the deep need that is driving all of the stuff that is getting kicked up in my mind. And then I anchor myself in the need. I hold on to that need. And I let go of all of the strategies and all of the ideas and all of the habitual things I may or may not do, which are usually some attempt to anesthetize my feelings. So I give up this old pattern of not feeling and I develop the courage to feel and the willingness to feel. And then I take the feelings and I get really in touch with my needs. And once I get an awareness of the needs that are up for me, let's say I have a need to be seen and known and for deep understanding and connection. Maybe that's the thing that isn't getting met and that's kicking up pain in my system. Mm. When I relax into that need, then I move into the fourth step that Marshall talks about, which is what request, what do you want? Mm. So now what I do is I simply refine my thinking and my mind and my strategies and my habits. I take that all as the rough draft material and I align them with what is the thing, what is one thing that is 100% in my control? Not what I want other people to do differently. What is the one thing that is 100% in my control that I could do or say that gets me one step closer to getting these needs met. And the relationship with yourself here is that you take yourself seriously. Your feelings matter, they're not crazy. Your needs matter, they're not needy and high maintenance and dependent and weak. You start relating with yourself with awareness, with connection, with trust. You know about your feelings, you know about your needs and you begin to get co-creative in your life by once you've put your attention on that data, coming up with new ways of speaking, of being, of choosing, of not choosing, of acting, of not acting, that you are trying to get more into alignment with the needs that you want to get met in that situation. And then a key piece about where a request is very different from a demand is that we, we come with the consciousness of playfulness lightheartedness, experimentation, trial and error, invitation. There's no clamping down. This must happen. I have to, I must, I should, the right way. Any of that energy is the demand energy that kicks up people's defensiveness and resistance because people have a very, very deep need for freedom and choice. And if somebody, your inner being or anyone else, gets any whiff of, I have to do something and I don't have a choice, your very healthy psychological immune system, your spiritual immune system will kick up and say, no, okay? You'll have a rebel that kicks, kicks up and says, no, you can't make me. You'll have a teenager that kicks in and says, absolutely not, I rebel. Or you'll have a good girl or a good boy who's a little bit scared and really prioritizes safety over everything else who says, okay, yes, 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 I'll just do what you want me to do because I don't want you to be upset and we give away our power and we submit and then we do stuff we say yes in the short run and then of course it builds a lot of resentment and toxicity and inner conflict so we don't want to be submitting and we don't want to be rebelling because those take a tremendous amount of energy we want to be co-creating so we ask and we're open to hearing a yes and a no so that's like the brief primer again on like the question I think that you're asking is when my thinking is so focused on judging and blaming, how do I shift that to NVC consciousness? So you start with your intention. My intention is to shift into nonviolence, into connection, into compassion. So you get really clear on that intention and then you harness your attention and you pay attention to the observations, the feelings, the needs and the requests that you have available to you in that moment to begin creating something different. Mm 